Hello and welcome. Um, today we are going to talk about pesticides, specifically the different classifications of pesticides. We'll look at some examples of pesticides that are or were on the market. And then we're going to look at some integrated pest management techniques and ways to control pests um, without the use of chemicals. Lastly, we'll finish it up with some genetically modified organism talk. All right, so let's get started. First, we should probably start off with what is a pest, right? So a pest is usually an organism that is not wanted. Um, so it could fit a variety of these categories here. Um, it competes with us for food. It invades our lawns and gardens. It destroys wood and houses. It could spread disease like mosquitoes and just a general nuisance. So what humans have created are pesticides that are used to control those organisms. Take a look. These are some just common um, pests that can invade our food or lawns, etc. These are pea aphids. They are known to destroy pea plants. We also have the gypsy moth caterpillars. In fact, any caterpillars usually do practice herbivory and they eat the leaves of plants. And lastly, we have the emerald ash borer here. This is a bug that particularly likes the emerald ash. So us humans, we decided we needed to get rid of these pests. So we invented something called pesticides. There's different categories of pesticides. So let's go through each of these. Uh, an insecticide is something that kills insects. You've got your herbicides, those are the ones that kill weeds. Fungicides, they usually kill fungus. Nematocides kill worms. And lastly, rodenticides kill rodents. So if you go to your local Home Depot, you could probably see all these in one section, one shelf. And so for example, like Roundup, that's been in the news lately. Um, that is a very, very, very famous herbicide. A lot of people spray it on their the cement or concrete or their bricks to make sure that weeds and stuff don't grow in between them. Uh, Raid is very famous. Raid is a common insecticide. So you usually buy it to kill insects around your house. Um, there's different kinds. They have like ant raid and cockroach raid and spider raid, but they're all out there and they're all meant to kill um, bugs. And then lastly, you might have seen decon. This one is a very famous rodenticide, so it kills rodents. So their application is pretty simple and sometimes students do get it confused with fertilizer application because it looks very similar. So what the farmers do is they load up the pesticides into whatever contraptions they have to deliver it and then they spray the pesticide on their field. Um, you can see some of them can be quite toxic in very concentrated amounts. So um, farmers do take extra precaution to um, when they're applying the pesticide. And then if you ever see this, just stay away from the field. It's not worth playing on it at that moment. <laughs> so let's go into the types of pesticides that are around. So one very famous type is the chlorinated hydrocarbon pesticide. So if you just break down the name, you could probably figure out that the elements chlorine, hydrogen, and carbon are in this chemical, right? And a good example of one that is now banned in the United States is DDT. DDT is a very, very famous chlorinated hydrocarbon. It was invented by Paul Mueller, and he actually received the Nobel Prize for his invention in 1948 because it was, at the time, a wonderful broad spectrum insecticide. That means once you applied it, it killed many, many, many species on our crops. And so farmers were absolutely in love with it. However, we noticed a couple years later that DDT did not stay in place. It ran off the farms, it went into the nearest waterways, and then it started accumulating in the waterways. Um, that led to a process called bioaccumulation. So then the plants took it up, the little fish species took it up, 
bigger fish species ate the little ones, they took it up. And so what you were getting is higher up on the food web, a lot of these organisms were accumulating a lot of DDT, way more than, than they would just simply by eating the product where it was sprayed. One of the organisms we saw bioaccumulation occur in with DDT was the bald eagle. Now DDT is fat soluble. That means it is stored in your fats and it makes it very difficult to get rid of from your body. Well, as it was getting passed along the food chain, unfortunately the bald eagle were eating the larger fish and it accumulated in them. Well, what was some of the um, effects of that one thing is that they were laying shells that were deficient in calcium. Um, so scientists found out that DDT actually interfered with the ability of calcium uptake in bald eagles. So when they went to go sit on their eggs, the eggs actually cracked. Okay, and so that led to a real, real decimation of their population because they weren't reproducing. Um, obviously, as you know, the DDT has been banned and the bald eagle has made a recovery because we have banned this chemical. Another side note about DDT, it is a neurotoxin. So what is a neurotoxin? It is a chemical that affects your nervous system. What it does in insects specifically is it causes their sodium channels to open in their nervous system. When they open, that leads to cell death, at least to spasms and things like that. So the insects were being killed through this method. However, they did notice that some bugs were actually becoming resistant to DDT. And we're going to talk about the pesticide treadmill in just one second. So what does DDT do to the human body? Well, it actually does a lot of things. Um, the first thing we found out that it is carcinogenic, that means it's cancer causing. It does have the ability to mutate our DNA and our genes. Second of all, it's an endocrine disruptor. So it's definitely a chemical that interferes with our ability to produce hormones or the delivery of those hormones throughout our body. It has been linked to diabetes, what hasn't been linked to diabetes. And unfortunately, it has also been linked to miscarriages. In 1962, there was a scientist by the name of Rachel Carson. She was actually studying the effects of DDT on the surrounding environments. Um, she also discovered the bioaccumulation of DDT in environments, and she published her results in a book that I had to read in college called Silent Spring. All right, that leads us to our next type of pesticide and those are the organophosphates. So we just talked about the chlorinated hydrocarbons. Now we're moving on to the organophosphates and a very, very famous organophosphate that you may have heard of is malathion. It's an insecticide. It's commonly used to treat lice and scabies, um, but it's also used to combat fruit flies. Um, here, in Southern California, we have a lot of produce, as you may know. Um, some of the areas in Southern California have a lot of orange trees and lemon trees. They're very much known for their citrus trees. Well, um, there was a Mediterranean fruit fly that was introduced into that area. And one of the ways they combated the fruit fly was by spraying malathion to kill the fruit fly. So again, here's another picture of the application. So they can also use what are called crop dusters to apply the pesticide. And so then that leads us to why should we use pesticides, right? If we know these chemicals may be dangerous, why are we using them? And I think the best argument that you can say is that it can save lives. When you spray pesticides and you kill mosquitoes, for example, you just killed off the vector for malaria. And as we know, malaria can be quite deadly in places um, like Africa or tropical regions. Two, also pesticides, it increases food supplies, right? If pests aren't eating our food, we can produce more food to feed the world. Um, also, it increases money, profits for farmers. If they are able to sell more food, then they can make more money. Then of course that leads us to why we shouldn't use them, right? <laughs> well, one thing that we've noticed that happens with pesticides is something called the pesticide treadmill. 
okay? So say you're a farmer and you go out and you spray your field, right? Um, you, you spray it on all the field. However, there's a couple of organisms that were, I'll just say pretty strong or mutants or resistant to that pesticide. So like 98% of the bugs die off, but that 2% that are a little bit stronger, maybe a little bit more resistant to the pesticide, they lived. Well, what are they gonna do? They're going to reproduce and make more of themselves, right? More like themselves. So what you do get over a series of generations is a population that is much more resistant to the pesticide than once was. So what does the farmer do? Well, they have two choices, right? They can go in and then hopefully spray more of the pesticide, which could lead to pretty harmful environmental effects, or they can spend a lot of money and maybe research and switch the pesticide to kill off the remaining bugs. So that whole process is called the pesticide treadmill. Also, we know that pesticides, they don't stay in place. They can run off into the waterway and they can definitely be ingested by species that they weren't intended for. So you do get the loss of life from the non-target species. Um, sickness, right? Humans can get sick. We know that some people are very allergic to pesticides or just the constant exposure of being in the fields and working can make you extremely sick. There's two different types of sickness when we talk about pesticides. There's acute sickness and um, chronic sickness. Acute sickness tends to be short term. So things like headaches and nosebleeds and rashes, those would be all acute sicknesses associated with pesticide use. Chronic would be you're constantly being exposed um, not short-term exposure to the pesticide. And so if that chronic exposure happens, you are more likely to develop things like cancers. So the federal government was concerned about pesticide usage on our farms and specifically human consumption of those pesticides. So a law was created called FIFRA, the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act. Pretty much what it says is that if you create a pesticide and you use it, you have to get approval from the EPA. So all pesticide use must be approved by the Environmental Protection Agency. Second of all, if you create that pesticide, you must run the toxicity test for that pesticide. You have to figure out at what dose is it lethal and at what dose is it safe and submit that to the federal government. So that leads us to an integrated approach to pest management. So this is called integrated pest management. And the idea is to cut down on chemical usage and maybe integrate more approaches that are more, I would say, environmentally friendly in controlling the pests. So it is a combination of both the chemical pesticide usage as well as some of the biological components that you can do to control your pests. So if you're a farmer, there are some alternates to chemical pesticides. You can introduce a natural biological predator. So whatever is eating your crops, figure out what that predator is and introduce it into the area, specifically if it is natural. Um, we see that sometimes with ladybugs. People will go buy ladybugs because they love to eat aphids. You can put up a smell that kind of attracts the bugs away from your crops. Um, some bugs are really attracted to certain smells, to pheromones. And so if you put them away from your crops, then the bugs will get deterred. It's not gonna keep them all away from your crops, but it's definitely going to keep a majority of them away. Something that can only work with certain plants is you can spray boiling water on them. Some bugs are really, really, really um, sensitive to heat. And so when you spray boiling water on them, obviously they may pass away. But again, you can only do this with plants that are pretty hardy. Like if you go and you spray boiling water on lettuce, it'll probably wilt up and die. Something that has been talked about with integrated pest management is the use of genetically modified organisms. A GMO is an organism that contains the genes of another species. And usually humans are the ones that inserted that gene into the GMO so that we could get some sort of expected outcome. Why could we use this in integrated pest management? Well, say you can take a, a carrot, for example, and modify its genetic code 
so that it could be resistant to some sort of bug that's common to eat it. Well, then you wouldn't have to use chemical pesticides on your fields. Genetic modification of organisms have happened recently, and here's a good example of one. Um, this is called the Bt gene, and the Bt gene was actually taken from a bacteria and inserted in corn. Why did scientists do this? Well, that gene actually disrupts the guts of insects and makes them die. There was a specific bug called the corn borer that was eating corn, and so when scientists put this gene in the corn, the boar would eat the corn and then it would no longer survive. Here is a picture of what the corn borer looks like. And of course, if the corn has the Bt gene in it, it won't be eaten by the corn borer. What are some of the great things about genetically modified organisms? Well, there's a plethora of things to choose from. You could modify organisms so that it doesn't require as many pesticides. Maybe you can modify them to have higher nutritional content, something like we saw in the golden rice. Uh, what if we could deliver vaccines with genetically modified organisms? Wouldn't that be kind of cool where you just eat a carrot and then you have the flu vaccine? <laughs> I know a lot of people would prefer doing that than getting shot in the arm with the vaccine. There are some not so good things about using genetically modified organisms, and you can see the list is just as long as the advantages. Uh, one of the big things is that um, when you genetically modify an organism, you have messed with their DNA sequence, right? So sometimes those organisms can get out or escape, and they can go mate with the wild version or the natural version of that organism. When they mate, you have now reduced the genetic biodiversity of that species because you introduced this non-natural um, gene sequence that wasn't there to begin with. Superbugs can emerge. That's something we talked about with DDT. Um, allergens may be present in the genetically modified food and people wouldn't know it, so they would have allergic reactions. And also, Something we should think about, do we want companies to genetically modify organisms and patent them? We're kind of giving the control of our food production to certain businesses. Do we really want to centralize or monopolize our food resources? All right, well, that concludes our talk on pesticides. I hope all of this was extremely helpful, and thank you so much for watching.